Come on in. Welcome to Diedled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we've got a tricky, treaty Halloween special. Five times Survivor players were tricked by production. It's the scariest possible thing that can happen to you on Survivor. You're in a good position, your game is going well, then Probst busts out the old Twistomatic, and all of a sudden you're on your way to Ponderosa. Lots of players have been swap screwed and advantaged out of the game, but these five twists to me represent the biggest tricks Survivor ever pulled on its players. From fake merges to advantages that punish you for grabbing them, to just straight up yoinking immunity away from the rightful winners. For those on the receiving end, these tricks were far from a treat. So turn the lights down low, grab a bowl of candy corn, and crack open a pumpkin flavored drink of your choice as we dig in to five spooky times that survivor players were tricked by production. At number five are the production created fake immunity idols in Survivor 44, designed only to create humiliating fake idol plays. You know, back in the day, if you wanted a fake immunity idol, you had to make one yourself. You didn't have to put much effort into it, but you did have to make it. In Survivor 44, 33 seasons after the immunity idol's debut, production finally supplied fake idols to players for the first time, indistinguishable from the real deal. I am so torn on this twist. On the one hand, I love how idols worked this season, that they were hidden in this very public bird cage, greatly increasing the risk of obtaining them. But free fake idols as well seems a tad… OP. To account for the extra risk, inside each bird cage on each tribe is both a real idol and a fake to use how you will. Increasing the deception, each tribe's real idol is the fake of another tribe's. On Tika, the coin is the real idol, and the beads are the fake. On Ratu, the beads are real, and the medallion is fake. And on Soka, the medallion is real, and the coin is fake. White obviously a survivor was trying to incentivize fake idol plays. Despite the perceived unfairness of the fake idols when the season was airing, the fake idols never really impacted much. The only person who fell for a phony idol was Sarah, and she went home with it in her pocket. Ironically, the fake idol which impacted the game the most was Jamie's fake idol, which was created by Matthew. Proof that you should always shop local, not one of those tacky big box places. Poor Jamie thought this idol was the real deal up until the after show segment when Jeff let her know that the idol she'd had since the pre-merge was not legit. Uh, Jamie, some bad news. You're literally the nicest and most wholesome human being ever cast on the show, but your whole storyline is just going to be us mercilessly dunking on you for getting tricked by some man bun who fell off a cliff. Sorry. At number four are the surprise return of eliminated players in both Survivor Pearl Islands and Survivor Edge of Extinction. I have no issues with sparingly allowing eliminated players to earn their way back into the game through some sort of Redemption Island style battle back, but I'm generally of the opinion that this should be a mechanic everyone is aware of beforehand. In these two seasons, no one knew that the players they were voting out pre-merge would be able to earn their way back into the game, and in some cases undo the very games of the players who previously bested them. The first time this happened in Pearl Islands, it was the Outcasts twist, generally agreed to be the worst iteration of this twist ever, where the first six eliminated players were secretly living on the Outcast tribe after their vote off which is definitely 100% not a Holiday Inn. This tribe of pre-merge misfits, which Skinny Ryan dubbed the Jerks in German in his Outcast buff, had the opportunity for some of their members to earn their way back into the game via Immunity Challenge, which they won. That Continental Breakfast was working overtime. The Outcasts could collectively vote back in two players to return to the game, and they chose Burton, which makes sense, and also Lil. It's long been rumored that they didn't so much as vote Lil back into the game, as vote Lil out of the pre-merge trip because they didn't want to spend time with her. 
I don't know if that's true, but I choose to believe it is true. In Edge of Extinction, eliminated players were secretly sent to a remote island designed to push the limits of how close a camera can get to a face in a confessional. And at the merge, a surprise battle back took place between all of the pre-mergers for their shot to earn their way back into the game, shocking and upsetting the non-eliminated players. Oh, Wendy's still here? Somewhat surprisingly, in both instances, I would say that all three of the unexpected pre-merge returnees made these seasons better. Burton's smarmy, ego-driven overplaying makes him one of the most fun characters to watch in a season brimming with major personalities. And Lil is genuinely one of the most unintentionally hilarious players of all time. A sad sack scoutmaster who had no business sniffing the merge, let alone the final two. And Devins goes on to unequivocally be the star of the season, even though I know, I know, he's a love him or hate him character. Be real though, you didn't want more comma, did you? Yeah, I'm jonesing for more of the dynamic personalities of Gavin and Eric. At number three is Jamal's advantage in Survivor, Island of the Idols. After being on the outs of the merge of Island of the Idols for trying to be decent human beings, Jamal and Karishma were understandably advantage hunting in the jungle after Kelly's elimination. Mercifully, Jamal finds an advantage dangling from a tree. Finally, the season is going to turn around, the likable underdogs have some ammo, and... Oh. Oh no. Oh god no. Jamal's advantage is anything but. Turns out this thing is actually a one-way trip to Island of the Idols, where Jamal is informed that he has lost his vote. Why? Because he grabbed this advantage, and should have known better, because there are no free lunches on Survivor. This is what Boston Rob actually tells him. Ignoring the fact that Ben was practically waking up from naps with idols stuffed up his ass just four seasons prior, what is the lesson here? Don't trust your lying eyes? I like beware advantages because they warn you that taking them comes with a cost. This one just says, you found me, I'm yours. Now that would be a pretty major red flag if you read it on a Tinder profile, but on Survivor, this is pretty appealing. Nevertheless, Jamal loses his vote and is instead given a pen and parchment to do with what he will. He creates a fake legacy advantage and gives it to the only possible person in Survivor history who might believe that a handwritten note is a real advantage, Dean. Jamal is sent home next. This fake advantage was just a straight up lie, and I will always contend that literally anyone on Survivor, Boston Rob and Sandra included, would grab a dangling note in the jungle, especially if it was flirting with them that hard. At number two is the fake merge in Survivor Thailand. This, to me, is the first moment Survivor actually tried to overtly trick players into screwing up their own games by using intentionally vague language. At the final 10 of Survivor Thailand, the players are brought together for what is assumed to be the merge. You know, like the last four seasons. After settling on the Chewy Gone camp, they created a new tribe name, there was a merge feast, new women to creep out, you know, typical merge stuff. But when they assembled for what they all believed to be the first immunity challenge of the season, Jeff informs him that they have gravely misunderstood him. What I said to you guys when you left is something very different is about to happen. Two tribes will live together on the same beach. That's exactly what you're doing. You are two tribes living on the same beach. The two tribes never merged. Oh, the two tribes never merged. Really? Then what was this feast, Jeff? The coming together on the same beach feast, Jeff? I unironically love Jeff's smug tone here, as if they're the idiots for falling for this trick because he didn't say the magic words. Overall, this is hardly the most egregious twist in Survivor history, and Jeff's cheeky wordplay is pretty funny in hindsight. The only thing it really cost us was Sheehan on the jury, which, yeah, you know her jury speech to these two in particular would have ruled. At number one is the hourglass twist in Survivor 41. 
This should come as no surprise to anyone. This is a twist that even Jeff Probst has admitted was misguided, and which will undoubtedly never return. Although this also appeared in Survivor 42 with some of the kinks ironed out, it's the Survivor 41 iteration I want to talk about. The most blatant example of production tricking contestants by just straight up lying to them. At the merge of Survivor 41, the final 12 were randomly divided into two groups of 10, with two randomly selected sit-outs, Erica and Nasir. These two teams had to earn their way to the merge via a brutal immunity challenge, and um, yeah, the team with the Dallas Cowboy beat the team of old ladies. After earning their way into the merge as promised, the challenge victors chose Nasir to join them, exiling Erica. With safety via their merge buff, this high stakes first merge vote can now only be between one of the six challenge losers and Erica. At Exile, Erica was given a secret choice. She can either leave things as they are, with her on the losing team and vulnerable for elimination at the next tribal council, or smash this hourglass and Sherika can turn back time. Changing history by making the losing group, herself included, the winners. So to recap, Erica's options are be one of six people eligible for elimination, or not be one of six people eligible for elimination. When Erica returns at the next immunity challenge, she reveals that she smashed the hourglass, obviously, and made the immunity winners the losers and vice versa. The only time in Survivor history when someone's immunity win was straight up taken away. Both Danny and Sydney, who was ultimately voted out because of this, have spoken about how unfair they believe this twist was. After a better but still not great version in Survivor 42, when the funniest person possible, Roxroy, was given the decision to smash the hourglass or not, the much maligned hourglass was quietly retired, presumably smashed forever. This is the furthest Survivor ever got into just being straight up Mario Party, where losers are randomly rewarded for losing. Some things are just sacred in Survivor, and one of the laws of Survivor has always been that if you earn immunity, you cannot be voted out. To mess with that seems almost sacrilegious. Thankfully, the show agrees and the hourglass is gone forever. Still, this was like when your little cousin squeaks out a win at Mario Party because they got a star at the end for losing the most minigames or something. Why is that rewarded? Got nothing else for ya. If you just found me, I'm yours. Like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.